Hey, thanks for joining me on a very special edition of Two Guys and a Lot of Wine. I'm Bobby P. Jim is stuck, stuck up in Boston because of our latest snowstorm, but I'm very pleased to have a wonderful guest, Mr. Noah Ullman from Czech Wine Imports. Thank you, Noah, for joining me. Thanks for having me here, Bobby. And we've talked about Czech wines numerous times over the years, Jim and I, but we've never had a chance to taste the variety we're about to test tonight. taste tonight, and I'm really looking forward to it. So thanks again for bringing him in. Pleasure. And we have a lot to drink tonight, so I think um, as you're talking about the first one, yep. um, I'm going to pour. Great. Sounds good. So, so what is our first wine? We're starting with a, a Gruner Veltliner, and I love starting this wine, A, because it's the right wine from a, from a weight standpoint, but B, it helps set up uh, where these wines are coming from. So if, if anyone's drinking Gruner today, it's likely they're drinking it from Lower Austria. Lower Austria and Moravia, where these wines are from in the Czech Republic, share a border. Uh, and it is believed that Romans planted Gruner uh, back in the third century uh, in this region. So Gruner's been grown in this part of the world for a very, very long time. And I think that the uh, terroir in South Moravia really does uh, express this grape uh, very nicely. It has a wonderful bouquet right off the bat. Um, you can sort of even smell it before I even got up to my nose. I love the uh, aromatics on these wines. The, the aromatics are very important to, uh, to Czech winemakers. And for me, my taste, there's a little acidity here, which I like in a white. Um, it's, uh, it's certainly not cloying at all. I like the flavor profile a lot. I think uh, this is the kind of white that I would enjoy with a spicy meal. Um, but just drinking it on its own, I think, would stand up to just my palate anyway. So that's I good, too. Gruner's a fabulous grape, and it really does offer a lot of flexibility. It's a favorite of sommeliers because of uh, how, how well it pairs with lots of food. And I love that little, I think you're right, the acidity is, is great in here, but I love that little kind of spicy finish on this. Yeah, like hint of, hint of it, it sure does. And i, I got to quickly ask you, um, how did you get into the, the Czech wine mm -hmm. distribution business to begin with? Because I know you're like me, wine is a hobby, but at the same yep. time, you're actually working in it along with doing your other real professional jobs. So uh, my wife and I started this business uh, about five years ago in partnership with a Czech colleague. Uh, we were based overseas for a number of years and um, we discovered these fabulous wines from Moravia. At the time, my wife and I were drinking a lot of other cool climate wines. Uh, when we moved back to the States, we went looking for Moravian wine, realized we couldn't get any in the, in the US, yeah. called up my, uh, my colleague who at the time was working for the, uh, the president of the Czech Somali Association. And uh, I said, let's bring some of these wines into the U.S. And he said, really? I said, yeah. He goes, well, we drink all of it. I said, what do you mean you drink all of it? He goes, well, you know, we're a net importer of wine. We, we, it's a very small country uh, with a very small wine production, uh, but we love our wine and we tend to drink all of it. I said, well, if you can talk to some wineries and get them, you know, agree to export, uh, we'll bring them on and try to make a make a market for them in the U.S. And even with, even because they don't export a lot, the price point works where you can. It's still a profitable endeavor to do. We uh, we are we work very hard to find wines of a specific quality that uh, and all the wines on the table tonight retail uh, here in Connecticut for less than twenty dollars. Well, that's good to know. So, so everything here is available in Connecticut. Everything here is available in Connecticut. Everything here on the table should be at your local retailer for less than twenty bucks a bottle. Yeah. Well, that's. I mean, people are going to be seeing this show in March, so uh, I'm going to say right off the bat, this is a great early spring white to sort of jump right into a Czech wine. I want to say Czechoslovakian, but Noah corrected me earlier. I really shouldn't say Czechoslovakian. Well, you know, it's interesting. <coughs> Would you mind? We'll pour and because uh, uh, the, oh, yes. the recent. So we, we uh, you know, the, the history of the wines in this part of the world is much longer than the history of, of the country or the borders <laughs> on the map. So Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic as a country is about 20 years old. Czechoslovakia predating that was a construct after World War I. Uh, Czechoslovakia is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. Um, prior to that, it was all part of the Habsburg Holy Roman Empire, and it, uh, uh, the Kingdom of Moravia was a place, and the Kingdom of Bohemia was a place, and Moravia and Bohemia came together to form the Czech Republic. So uh, if you're a fan of beer, uh, Bohemia is famous for their beer. They yep. border Bavaria in the south of Germany. They invented Pilsner. Uh, the original Budweiser came from Bohemia, uh, but in the east, in Moravia, they've always been a wine culture since Romans planted grapes there. Uh, they have archaeological evidence going back to the year 278 A.D. Well, that's what I, I love old wine. <coughs> so that's what's, that's what's always fascinating to me about the, the region wine has grown and how many generations and hundreds, thousands of years that they've been growing wine in the same location. Thousands of years in this location. And what's even more mind-boggling about this particular region is that it's a very small region, uh, but in this tiny region, they have 14,000 registered producers. And for context, 
There are only 9,000 registered producers in all of North America. Uh, so it's, it's family wine, it's village wine, it's family plots that have been handed down time and time again. Um, and it's, it's really ingrained into the culture of this. Uh, and you're getting the personality religion. in these wines because uh, that's what you're getting. You're getting personality in these I, wines. I think there's a lot character. Of, of character and sense of place in these wines. What is our second wine? Second wine is a, is a Riesling. It's a dry Riesling. It's a very typical style Riesling for Central Europe. Uh, you should sense uh, and taste some really nice fruit on there, but you won't have that the sweetness that's typical with uh, many other imported Rieslings. Oh, that's good. I mean, I've always been a fan of Riesling, and we've done, a, I think, two shows on Riesling over the years. I tend to like this style of Riesling. Um, the character is there right up front, and there's not a lot of lingering sweetness afterwards at all. This is really, really a very subtle, but yet, I'm a Riesling type of wine. I like that. I, uh, I'm a huge fan of this wine. I, I, I love the Riesling grape, and I think when it's too sweet, it gets um, overpowered by the sugar. Mm -hmm. The reason why I think Riesling makes a great, it does make a great sweet wine. If I'm having a dessert wine, I, I love having uh, uh, a TVA. Uh, but one of the reasons I think Riesling makes a great sweet wine is because the acidity is so bright. Yeah. My, my mouth is still watering from Actually, from yeah, I just noticed that. I just sort of, yeah. <laughs> you probably can't see this, but we have a lot of cheese and crackers yeah. on the table. But I really want to get to the wines first before I try to do any pairings. Yep. But I can see right now that that's a great wine that would go good with some of the stuff we have here on the edge. It goes great with the cheese and crackers and sausage we have on the table. It's also a brilliant wine uh, in the summertime if you want to pair it with um, with some of the local seafood that we get here in Connecticut. Yeah, and that's that's another thing because I know Jim and I, we talk a lot about pairing wines with food. And to me, that's always great to do, but I also like wine to stand on its own. And sometimes I don't want to eat anything. I just right. want to have a glass of wine. And uh, that's really good. And you said this is all in the same price category. Roughly, uh, you'd say, you know, 16 to 20 dollars is the range. And actually, even before we go to our third third one, I want to ask you a few quick questions about Czech wine for our viewers. When they go into a packed store or wine store, is there a region or a location in the store that they can look? Or is it labeled? How do they label it? So it's great that you asked that question because that, for me, when we started this business five years ago, that was, that was going to be a mark of success for us is when we walked into a store and we saw a Czech wine section. And uh, I'm really pleased that the first time I saw uh, a Czech wine section here in Connecticut was at one of my um, uh, local uh, bottle shops up in uh, northwestern Connecticut. Oh, bottle and shop. Yeah. <coughs> yes, I've no, heard no, of that no, place. It was, uh, it was Ledgebrook, uh, Ledgebrook oh. uh, Spirits. It's a, my, local, my local store. Um, but we, we've seen now Czech wine sections popping up in places in New York, um, in, in uh, Chicago, and in Texas. So I, it feels nice to really see some recognition of the region. If there isn't a Czech wine region, there's sometimes other whites or worldly whites, and sometimes they're paired in with a German-Austrian selection. There's a Slovakian also part of that same region too, a Slovakian. There wines. are some really fabulous Slovakian wines. Uh, there are even less of them in the U.S. than Czech wines. Yeah, that's one of the few I've actually had. I have a friend of mine who's from that region brought a couple bottles back one time and I tried them and I really enjoyed them too. Uh, those are really interesting mm -hmm. white wines. Only white, I never tried a red. I, uh, I, we, we partner with a Slovak uh, importer, and I had the last wine we'll taste tonight is a, is a St. Laurent. And it was, I had a Slovakian St. Laurent that was just brilliant, just a beautiful, beautiful wine. And I think a lot of us uh, who like wine and a lot of our viewers can have, and I hate to use the term again, millennials to think for the variety of wines that are coming out in the market because people want to try wines that they haven't seen before. They want to experiment with wine, just like they're doing with beer. Craft beers are big. Craft wines should be good. Now, I, you could classify these in a way as craft wines because they're not common. People aren't familiar with them, but they want to be familiar with them. and They want to have access to them. Well, I love that. I think wine is an adventure. Wine is an adventure of the palate. Wine is an adventure of the planet. Uh, wine is an adventure of different styles of a, a grape and how a winemaker treats that grape. So um, I applaud anybody who's going to put down the Chardonnay and pick up something that they've never seen or heard of before based maybe upon a recommendation from Absolutely. somebody they trust or an education they get on a wine show like this, uh, that they're willing to try something new. Because there's, there's, there's hundreds, if not thousands, of really interesting, exciting wines out there. Yeah, don't always be drawn to that big Kendall Jackson, Modavi section. There's a place for that, but experiment, because there is so much that people are missing when you don't explore other aspects of your palate, which you might like. Agreed. So, two thumbs up for me right off the bat. Those were very, very enjoyable. Excellent. Right, right, right in the them. same range that I like my whites. So that was fantastic. So our third one here, 
Beautiful bottle, by the way. Actually, we'll talk about the bottles also before the end of the show. Uh, so I can chat about that now since we're going into a Templar wine. The wines that we've labeled, uh, Vinos Czech is a loose translation of wine of Czech. Uh, all, you can see that these two are from the same winemaker. You can tell by the capsule and the cork, and we do mention the winemaker on the back of the label. Uh, this is from a third winemaker, and this is from a fourth winemaker. They're all carrying the label uh, artwork of Alphonse Mucha, who is a Czech-born uh, Art Nouveau artist. Most of this work was done in the late 1800s, early 1900s. I think I've seen some of his work on the Antique Roadshow. Uh, I'm sure you have. <laughs> I and, believe and I have. That name sounds very familiar. There are museums uh, dedicated to him uh, around the world. He's really uh, uh, quite a fabulous, uh, fabulous artist. And um, so we decided to label, to create awareness for Czech wines, we decided to label uh, the, across our, our line using that artwork. This wine, and it's uh, sibling here, the Pinot Noir, is from Templar Wine Cellars, which is actually one of the largest wine producers in the Czech Republic. That said, it's a drop in the bucket for what you, like a Kendall Jackson, or right. it's less than a week of sales, I think, for Kendall Jackson. Uh, so uh, the Templar wines uh, are actually, uh, it's a true Knights Templar story. Let's, let's have a oh, sip. Yeah. I, I gotta Cheers. say, we mentioned Knights Templars. That's, uh, that's one of my little historical things I love to look into at Knights Templar. So that's, I was gonna ask about the Templar name, but. So it's a true Knights Templar story. The Knights Templar settled this part of the world in the year 1248. Their typical practice was to build a fort and dig wine cellars, and they've been making wine on the site ever since. This has a little bit golder of a color than the first two wines we've had. It's like a little bit on more of the, uh, the uh, wheat color, sort of white. You will, uh, you'll notice it's a little bit richer, a little bit rounder. Dry first, finish is stronger, definitely. This is at my palate. I, it opens up after you swallow. It opens up after you swallow, and then you get like a, a nice fruity uh, follow through. I think this is a really nice um, style Pinot Gris. As yeah. you know, Pinot Gris and Pinot Grigio are the same grape. But it's very fascinating to me that the, the regional differences of a Pinot Grigio from the valleys of Italy versus a Pinot Gris from, let's say, Alsace in France are completely different in the glass. And I think this is you know, leaning more towards the Pinot Gris. I got to quickly ask you, and I talked to Jim about this. Uh, can you, are these, I'd say this is a 2014, are there, is there an age limit to these? Can you store these for any the, time? The, you know, interestingly enough, the Czechs um, age their whites considerably. Uh, Americans tend to want fresher, newer mm -hmm. whites. Um, but I, I think that you know, the Riesling should certainly hold up. We, we uh, saw Gruner from the 1960s in one of our winemakers' cellars, wow. covered in mold and dust. It looks beautiful. And they said they, they opened one just a few weeks ago for a, uh, for a, a celebration. So they, they do hold their white wines. That's interesting. So you can, if you do want to buy, say, a case of this, it's no problem keeping a few in your cellar for. I think that as long as the wine is is uh, well cellared, mm -hmm. temperature doesn't change dramatically. Ideally, bottles on its sides, so the cork stays moist. Um, most of most of these wines will hold. Maybe the the um, this one we're going to try next a little bit less so. It's designed to be drunk very fresh, but um, Gruner, Riesling, and Pinot Gris should certainly hold for some time. That's great to know. That's great to know because I do like buying wine sometimes in bulk, and uh, keeping a few. You know, even if it's not super expensive wine, you know, for a few years down the line. Mm -hmm. So that's really good to know. Yeah, we, uh, we've been um, in this for five years now, so some of our earliest vintages are uh, 2009. We have a red from 2007, but the earliest white is a 2009. They tend to, you know, peak out, and the flavor profile changes a little bit, but I, I really do enjoy an, an aged white very much. That's really good to know. Thanks for sharing that with me. So I got to say, once again, uh, all these wines that we've had so far, fantastic. The I'm first three. I'm pleased you like that. First three, yep. So <clears throat> this is called uh, Ravonner, and along with uh, the Gruner Veltliner, th this is the number one and number two most planted grapes in the Czech Republic. Um, roughly nine, you know, percent, nine to ten percent of total plantings each. And we're talking about a country with a with a total um, vineyard area of uh, less than 60,000 acres. So it's a really small, by, by international standards, very small uh, global region. I think it ranks uh, around you know, 50 on the list of wine producing countries. Ravonner uh, is also known as Muller Turgau. Uh, this is a very popular grape in Central Europe. And in fact, for many years, it was the number one planting in Germany. It's currently number two behind uh, Riesling. Uh, often used in blends. But when it's, when it's sold as a standalone 
single vintage, mm -hmm. single varietal uh, grape, it's often labeled Ravana. Now, I wanted to ask you earlier when we started, I hadn't been able to look at the alcohol content of these whites. Are they in the, in the, they're in the general norm for whites? Or are they they're uh, you know, traditionally a little bit lower. So the, the acidity and the minerality that you're picking up is not being overpowered by alcohol. So we're looking at anywhere between 12, 12 and a half, maybe 13% on these wines. Oh, that's very different from the first three we've had. It sort of caresses my tongue right off the front. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I like that. It's sort of a, it's got a little sweetness to it, but not a cloyingly sick sweetness to it. It's a, it's just, I think it's a good balance. It's a fascinating wine. And this is one of these wines that I love to drink on its own. It is a great, you know, spring, summer, afternoon wine. Um, the sweetness you're tasting, it's actually, it's classified as a dry wine. It just has so much fruit and it's a, uh, you know, like for me, it's, it's a lot of stone fruit, like a fresh peach and fresh apricot. Yeah, um, apricot. I do get the apricot. Which comes across as sweetness, but there's actually very low residual sugar. It's a restrained wine. apricot. That's yep. the thing. It's a restrained sweetness. And I will say, you know, Noah's had these, but he's been in the studio for about an hour or so, and these wines have sat for a bit, but they're still holding their own at this temperature. There's still a little chill to them, but... I think, if anything, the, the flavor probably has opened up a little bit better. I, I will share with you and, and your viewers that when I was selling these wines, you know, door-to-door -door on the streets, um, I, I really liked, I got to know them, you know, very intimately, and I thought day two, they were even better than day one. They're, they're really nice if you want to just open it up, have a glass or two, put the cork back in, uh, put it in the fridge, and then you can have it again the next day, and I think it actually tastes better the next day. Yeah, and it, uh, is this like most wines, if you're going to, do you don't finish the whole bottle? Generally, that's not a problem with gin. <laughs> but if you don't finish the whole bottle of white wines, what about two to three days, four days maybe in the fridge? Uh, two to three days, I think. A second day, they're great. I actually also very much like them on the third day. They're starting to degrade a little bit. Um, but, you know, oxygen is the enemy of wine. Yep. A little bit is good and too much is bad. Um, I've decided after, you know, experimenting with lots of different things, the, 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 um, the pump or spray or even the Coravin, um, I, you know, for these wines that are not, you know, $100 bottles of wines, uh, I, I just cork it and put yeah. it back in the fridge. I had a, a, somebody on the show a while back, uh, I think he was, a, I forget where he worked from, but he said if you have some half bottles, sometimes if you, it's really the air. You just pour it into a half bottle and you get rid of the air that way. It's all about the air. Yep. Uh, and and the, the flip side to that, and the, the reason why I don't like the pump is that it also takes, when you pump the wine, it takes the, the volatile uh, uh, aromatics out a little bit and it flattens it. But it's all about the air. So yeah. you can just get a good cork in there, seal it up, leave it as is. And or just do what we all do, just finish just the damn finish bottle. The bottle. Yes, just finish the bottle. Oh, that's such an easy wine to drink. This is, um, this is really one of my favorites. I, I love this wine. I love the winery. This winery is actually in the, they use the cellars of um, Chateau Veltiza, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It was one of the, um, uh, one of the Habsburg uh, Empire Castles actually is part of the Liechtenstein family. Oh, wow. Now Liechtenstein now has their own country, but prior to World War One, uh, they uh, they they the family owned uh, most of what is Southern Moravia today on the on the Czech Austrian border, and it is just spectacularly beautiful and not touristy. Uh, they do house the wine salon in the Czech Republic in the in the in the chateau in the castle where you can go and i think it's like less than seven dollars you can go in and taste the hundred hundred best wines of the year um in 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 the cellars it's a fabulous experience all right so i think we're into our reds now we're going to reds I think Excellent. we're going to reds now so this is a pinot noir from uh templar wine cellar so a sibling to the pinot gris we had earlier beautiful light Lightish red color. Beautiful light red color. I think this is, um, you know, this is a really classic European style Pinot, so it's going to be uh, a little bit brighter. In your, in your Pinot, Pinot Wars, I know they become super popular. Are yeah. they still, have they reached their peak yet? Or are they still, are they, are they declining uh, at all? You know, when I think of Pinot Noir, I think of Burgundy in France. And yeah. I think that Burgundy is timeless. So That's I, true. I, I think that it's interesting to see Pinot Noir being planted in parts of the world where uh, traditionally have not grown great Pinot. Uh, and I think the style of Pinot Noir is, is adapting a little bit. Uh, so the California Pinots in particular, maybe a little bit less so the Oregon Pinots, tend to be more fruit forward. Whereas for me, the, what I look for in a Pinot Noir is that earthiness. I want to taste forest floor. I want to taste mushroom. I want to taste um, 
uh, you know, even even there's a barnyard note on Pinot yeah, Noir, which it, I really like. And uh, this this is a kind of complex red for Pinot Noir because there is a lot going on. I'm trying to differentiate the subtle differences in flavor profiles that I'm tasting. It's one of those things you sort of have to leave in your mouth a little bit to uh, really get the, the subtlety of this Pinot Noir, which is really, some people would say is surprising at a price point at this, for a Pinot Noir at this price point to have this kind of complexity. But uh, it does, and it's pretty damn good. <laughs> that's, um, I'm pleased you noted that, because that's really what we love about this wine, is it's, it is subtle, but there, there are layers in complexity, and for, you know, 20 bucks or less, it's, it's, a, I think it's a great value. And it's, it's a good sense of a European-style Pinot Noir without, without breaking the bank. Yeah, I mean, you're, we try not to be wine snobs in this show, but there's no way you would say this is an American Pinot Noir tasting this one. Not even close. Not even close. Yeah. So there's a substantial difference. This is definitely more of a terroir-driven Pinot Noir than you would probably get here in the States. Um, I know there's good Pinot Noirs in the States, but this is my, this is my profile. I mean, I like a minerally red, and this is right up there with some of the better ones I've had at that price point, even a little higher than that, so. I'm pleased, yeah, this is a fun wine, and I'll tell you that most of these other wineries we work with are really small. So as an example, um, the, the Gruner and the Riesling that we tried earlier, the total annual production on those wines is somewhere between 500 and 800 cases, total, wow. worldwide. Uh, this Pinot Noir is in the 2000 case range, so it's a significantly larger winery that we work with, and my wife and I, who's partners in this business, we're, we're a little uh, cautious about working with all these larger wineries, but we've been continuously impressed with the quality of the wines and that sense of place and terroir that, that, that Templar delivers. Now, I didn't see the vintage on this one. What year is this 13. One? This is a 13. 13. And a Pinot Noir, you can do some aging, too, with that, right? Sure. Yeah, Pinot Noirs are, are great for aging. Is there a recommendation when this would actually be at its best point, or is it at its best point right now? Um, it has been, actually, this 13 has been getting continually better year over year, so I've been, I'm, I don't know where it's going to go. <laughs> you no, know, that's the thing. Sometimes you don't. I mean, that's what sometimes drives values of wines, because they actually do get better. And, uh, but this is really delicious, just as it is right I now. I think as long as there's a, um, you know, the first thing to degrade is the fruit. Uh, but I like the underlying flavor, so as long as there's a little bit of fruit left in this wine, I think it'll be, be great to drink. Well, before we even get to the last one, that's, that's actually why I really like this Pinot Noir, because there is such an underlying flavor profile that it's gone, but you keep asking yourself questions like, there's still more going on here. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it, it, a lot of reds don't do that. A lot of reds, they hit you, they're gone. This is still lingering, and I really like that a lot. A lot of uh, reds from warmer climates tend to be fruitier. So you've got a more mature and a, a, a riper grape that you're working with. You've got a, a grape that's got bolder flavors, and the fruit becomes the, the dominant uh, flavor in that wine. Whereas when you're working with cooler climate wines, I think you get more nuance and more subtlety, and in my opinion, a little more elegance in a wine that gives you that lingering flavor profile and um, uh, interesting mix of uh, different flavors in your palate. Well, I, w I, w I will say, no, that's probably one of my better Pinot Noirs I've had this price point on the show this in the last five years. Oh, so pleased to hear that. That was really good. Excellent. And there's no wine here. If I don't like something, I'm going to tell Noah that, eh, it's not my favorite. But you haven't given me any dogs yet. No. So uh, I'm sure the last one's not going to be a dog either. I, so. I hope not. <laughs> uh, I really love this last wine. This last wine is a St. Laurent. Uh, it's a very similar style grape to Pinot Noir, so it's a, it's a cool climate, thin-skinned red. Um, Saint Laurent, however, offers the, uh, uh, a little bit more uh, fruitiness, a little bit more fruit forward. And I've been drinking, Saint Laurent was a new grape to me, um, so I went exploring a little bit to, to identify other Saint Laurents. And I find that the dominant note in this grape variety tends to be cherry. And I've had some young ones from Austria in particular, that have been like Cherry Jolly Rancher, just like bang in your face. This wine, what I really love about this wine is it undergoes a little bit of malolactic fermentation. And malolactic fermentation, I'm sure you know, but for your viewers, is a, is a secondary fermentation that's actually a bacterial fermentation that produces lactic acid, yep. which you get in milk. So it produces a creaminess to the wine and a texture that I really love uh, mixed with this kind of bright cherry that you get in the flavor. So. And are these, um, uh, are these oak aged or metal cast or what, what This are is in a large, most of them are stainless steel. Um, while this undergoes the malolactic fermentation, it's in a large open wooden cask uh, that undergoes a, a process called batonnage. It's a French word for stirring it with a stick. <laughs> and they stir the wine up and uh, give it a little bit more oxida 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 wow. oxidation and uh, get that, that uh, malolactic fermentation going. And then they put it in stainless steel. 
Well, I just took my first sip, and boy, is that subtle and smooth. It just sort of makes love to your mouth. It really is nice. That's really nice. It is the texture of the wine, and I will I will point out now that my um, you know one of the jobs that my wife and I enjoy the most is trying to match the the Muka artwork to uh, the to wine. the style of the wine, which is why she's yeah. you know sexy and sultry. And I, I didn't even notice that until I even made my comment. So. She's a little fun and flirty. Yeah, yeah. So um, we try to mix it up and uh, really take advantage of this fabulous artwork from Alphonse Muka and the fabulous wines of his homeland in the Czech Republic. To finish with this one, it really makes a lot of sense because this really is so smooth and silky. Um, wow. What's the alcohol content on this one? Uh, I'm going to say around 13, but let me give you the exact number. Uh, 12 and a half. Well, I got to say, no, in our remaining two minutes, we not only got through five wines, but you really, well, you really brought in some spectacular, spectacular wines to Thank taste you very much. at this price point. So uh, if, if our viewers need any information on either to contact you via your webpage mm -hmm. or uh, what, what, uh, what can you So uh, if, you, if, you, if you can't remember anything, you just type in check wine uh, to, uh, to, to your favorite search engine, uh, we should be on the first page. Uh, there's, some, there's some official sites that are ahead of us, but we're on the first page. Um, the website is uh, uh, Vinos vinozcheck.com, like the label here, V-I-N-O-Z. And I'll have that up on our webpage also. Uh, but really just search Czech wines and they'll come up. And uh, as I mentioned, all these wines are available here in Connecticut. Uh, we have a great distribution partner in Connecticut. So go to your local wine shop. What, do you have any shops you could recommend that are carrying this right now? Uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to call out a specific shop because uh, I like, I love all of our customers. Good point. Equally. Yes. Uh, but go into your favorite shop and if they don't have Czech wines, say that they're available through uh, Deirdre Magnello selections and Murphy. So I know we uh, couldn't obviously cover everything tonight. Is there anything that you sort of wish you brought in, but you may want to talk about briefly uh, that we didn't get a chance to cover tonight? We, uh, there, there are a couple wines that are just truly fabulous uh, and, and eye-opening. There's, there's an indigenous grape in the Czech Republic called um, Cabernet Moravia. And we're actually out of stock right now. This is a wine that will be available in Connecticut. It's a crossing, not a blend. It's a cross between Cab Franc and Zweigel. And if you've had those two varieties, you'll realize they're kind of on the opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah. Cab Franc is herbaceous and, and really uh, uh, delicate, and Zweigelt's very punchy. Uh, as parents, this child of those two grapes uh, really exhibits the best in, in both. Well, thank you very much for coming on. Uh, it's really been a pleasure tasting your wines tonight, and uh, hope we can have you on again to taste some of the wines we didn't get to tonight. So I want to thank uh, Noah for being on the show tonight. I want to thank all our viewers, as always, and as usual. Keep Jim, me, and Noah. We're one.